for coming in is our undergraduate research showcase where uh, our winter term UCCS students will have the opportunity to present their policy research project in poster form. Um, a good time should be had by all and there'll be some, uh, some interesting work on display. That's from 12 to 1.30 next Wednesday uh, and you do need to RSVP. The best way to do that is via the UCCS website, uccs.ucdavis.edu. Okay, uh, with that, it's a pleasure to welcome today Professor Greg Duncan. Um, professor Duncan is a distinguished professor in the School of Education at UC Irvine. He spent um, the better uh, part of, of the first part of his career at the University of Michigan, where he also received his PhD in economics. And while at Michigan, he directed the panel study of thinking dynamics. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, there's at least two kinds of studies. Uh, the easy kind that I gravitate towards is cross-sectional. You do it once. Panel studies, you're following people forward for years. Very complicated studies, but they present the opportunity to learn a tremendous amount. And this is um, the panel study of income dynamics has, has um, yielded reams of, of critical information on, on uh, economics and factors that influence outcomes for, for Americans. Um, Dr. Duncan's work has focused more generally on factors that equip children to um, be happy, productive adults. He's the author of numerous publications and um, several books, including Restoring Opportunity, The Crisis of Inequality and the Challenge for Americans, which was published by SAGE in 2014. He's the recipient of many honors and awards, and he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the National Academy of Sciences. And he will speak today on evaluating preschool education programs, uh, focusing on what works and what doesn't. So it's a pleasure to call you to the podium, Professor Duncan. Thank you, Richard. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I trust everyone can hear me, right? OK, so I want to um, provide a bit of an overview of uh, the research uh, on early childhood education. I'll try to mix in some California-specific information that draw from some more general uh, national literature. Um, and I want to focus on policy. Right? So if you think about policy levers, uh, things we can actually change, um, they include funding slots. Right, We can give more money to Head Start or uh, early education programs of various kinds. Uh, we can try to regulate process quality. Uh, almost all states try to do this. Uh, we can um, try to regulate uh, what sort of curricula are in the classrooms. So these are all ways in which policy can potentially affect uh, what kids learn from uh, early education programs. I want to add a fourth um, policy lever, uh, which takes you out of early childhood education and brings you into connections between early childhood education and K-12 schooling. Uh, and I'll try to argue that unless we pay some attention to that connection, uh, we're not likely to have a very successful uh, early childhood education um, set of policies. So let me start out with uh, a little bit of uh, lay of the land for early childhood education in California. Uh, major programs and funding streams, quality standards. So I always, um, I actually, I'm going to be drawing from um, uh, a lot of the data from this uh, Learning Policy Institute. Anyone from the Learning Policy Institute here? Anyway, it's a great uh, it's a great publication. It's a, a bit of a advocacy uh, publication, but it has a lot of very very useful facts, uh, including this. And you know, I hate it when I say you probably when people are giving PowerPoint presentations and they always say you probably can't read this, but <clears throat> you probably can't read this, but uh, pay attention to the thickness of the uh, of the lines down here. Uh, it's mapping funders across the top um, with programs across the bottom. All right, so uh, Head Start, that's the easiest example. Uh, this is Department of Health and Human Services, uh, federal. Uh, this is the Federal Department of Education. And then this is the state of California. Right? And the thickness of the band uh, is proportional to the amount of money in the particular funding stream. So Head Start. Uh, in California, it's all uh, money from the 
feds, a uh, billion dollars uh, is spent on uh, Head Start, early Head Start program. Um, and that comes down here to the uh, Head Start program. Uh, on the other side, in the state of California, we've got uh, Prop 98, right, which is providing a lot of funding, uh, 1.6 uh, or so billion dollars. Some of it goes into transitional kindergarten programs. Uh, more of it goes into the state preschool program. So those are the, uh, the three major early education programs. And then you've got a, um, a collection of funding streams into uh, child care subsidies, in effect. A lot of it is through the CalWORKs uh, program. So these are um, a collection of, uh, of centers and family uh, child care uh, providers who are getting funding from various streams uh, and, uh, and providing services to uh, an assortment of kids. So you can see uh, collectively they add up to a lot of money, but they're coming from different streams, some federal and some, uh, some state. All right, so remember the first policy question was uh, funding slots, right? Is there capacity uh, in California to expand uh, funding and uh, put more kids into subsidized early childhood education. Uh, and if you look at the proportion of kids uh, in California that are eligible for uh, subsidized early childhood education, uh, and compare that to the fraction actually enrolled, uh, you can see there's a lot of capacity, right? For the zero to three year olds, only 14% uh, of uh, the potentially eligible population are actually enrolled in these programs. For four-year-olds, it's up to 69%, uh, but that still uh, isn't 100%. So if you think about the policy option of expanding uh, slots, putting more money into these kind of existing programs, uh, we could certainly do that through policy. Uh, but the question is, would that be worthwhile? Right? So uh, to answer that question, um, we have to turn to the literature uh, to ask to what extent I want to concentrate especially on four-year-olds. Uh, to what extent would funding or slots, either through Head Start or the pre-K program, um, benefit kids, right? And by and large, and this is uh, not um, California-specific, uh, but the evaluation of um, Head Start uh, nationally and evaluation of numerous state pre-K programs show that uh, over the course of the the year, the age four year, um, kids are learning quite a bit. Uh, and they're learning more than kids who aren't getting into Head Start or into the pre-K uh, program. Uh, their uh, literacy scores are higher. Their math scores are higher. Um, there's less evidence on socio-emotional development. But, uh, to the extent that's there, uh, well-designed programs can boost that as well. So if the goal is to try to provide at, uh, at age four, um, center-based uh, education services that boost kids' school readiness, um, the answer is, uh, by and large, we seem to be able to get that out of our early education program, right? So the option of uh, funding slots uh, is probably going to be a profitable one because uh, the existing slots seem to be uh, doing uh, a reasonably good job. Quite a bit of variation, but on average, uh, there's a boost. Um, what I just said. Okay, funding slots. Uh, moving on, uh, we can try to regulate the quality of early childhood education uh, through rating and improvement systems. Uh, all, almost all states have this. California has it. Um, it's trying to uh, set standards for class sizes and teacher qualifications and all sorts of other dimensions of the process goes on in the early education classroom. Uh, if we uh, rely on that to improve the classroom and therefore improve child outcomes, how effective is that? I want to talk about that evidence. And then finally, curriculum. Uh, if we mandate uh, curriculum, uh, is that going to produce uh, better child outcomes, more, promote more school readiness? Um, if you look at, again, um, this is from that same report, um, the kind of uh, quality standards that we have uh, in different 
California um, settings uh, varies a lot. Uh, transitional kindergarten, the state preschool program, and Head Start uh, tend to have uh, more quality standards than do uh, these um, family-based uh, child care uh, or centers that aren't part of this, this network. Um, there tend to be more uh, required credentials on the part of teachers. Right? There tend to be uh, regulations in class size. And there tend to be curriculum mandates, you know, developmentally appropriate curricula is what uh, the phrase is. Uh, in contrast, if you look at uh, the rest of the early education child care world, uh, there tend to be many fewer requirements. Right? So uh, the license exempt providers are uh, relatives. There's no informal care, and there are, there's no regulation there. Uh, family child care centers, there's some uh, regulation on staff child ratios, but no requirement on curriculum standards. Uh, and then for centers, uh, there are requirements for both uh, teacher requirements as well as uh, child student staff ratios. So it varies all over the place. But the question is, does any of this process quality regulation make a difference? Right? So there is um, uh, evidence on um, the policy option of improving uh, quality through regulation of better curriculum. Um, a lot of states uh, have these QRIS systems where they combine uh, information on uh, the structural characteristics of the class, teacher requirements, teacher uh, certification, and things like that. Uh, they often will uh, send observers out to the early childhood education centers with a kind of standardized instrument for rating classroom experiences. Um, there are a couple of uh, rating scales that are often used, the Eckers and the class. So the question is, um, if you do all this, if the state sets all this up and ends up with some centers with three stars and some with four stars and some with five stars, what's the evidence that the number of stars makes any difference? Right? What's the evidence that regulating uh, certain aspects of the structural or process quality of classrooms uh, actually produces kids, uh, boosts kids' school readiness? Uh, and the evidence here is very disappointing. Um, there's not a lot of really strong uh, random assignment evidence, but if you just look across uh, a variety of centers with two stars, some with four stars, some with five stars, uh, measure how the kids are doing when they come in uh, at the beginning of the year in terms of socio-emotional development, in terms of literacy and numeracy, uh, and then uh, assess those same things at the end of the year, right? So all the kids are gaining somewhat. Do they differentially gain according to the number of stars uh, that their center has experienced uh, or been given in this rating process? Um, there's no evidence that that's the case. Uh, that five stars is better than three stars in terms of promoting school readiness. So you know, maybe we'll um, end up with a better method for, uh, for rating quality, but what we seem to be doing now with a hodgepodge of, uh, of kind of criteria, uh, when you relate it to what kids are actually gaining over the course of the, uh, the year, um, there's really no correspondence between the number of stars and what kids are gaining. Very, uh, very disappointing because all states have built up this QRS system uh, on the expectation that they're really um, doing a better job of promoting school readiness on the part of kids. What about curricula? Right, that's another uh, that's another policy differ. Uh, curricula uh, dictate what is going on in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. It provides the way that teachers can. Uh, can learn what the activity should be, how they can support those, uh, uh, those activities. And broadly speaking, um, there are uh, three kinds of curricula that end up showing up in early childhood education classrooms. Um, whole child, uh, sometimes called constructivist uh, curricula, are uh, the most widespread. Um, it's uh, it's a, a kind of approach that's heavily recommended by early, early developmental psychologists. Uh, it's the idea that kids should be uh, learning through exploration. Uh, you set up your classroom with various um, learning materials. You uh, 
uh, let the kids um, discover what sort of materials they might be interested in. And then you have a teacher who um, helps the child learn by supporting that learning in the context of those uh, learning materials that they become engaged with, right? It's a kind of Montessori approach. Um, it's hard to pull off those, right? If you think about the task of providing learning experiences for kids over the course of a year, you really want uh, a teacher to be able to um, recognize what the opportunities for learning are when a child engages in a particular uh, kind of uh, learning activity. And you want to somehow, over the course of the year, support increasingly sophisticated literacy development, increasingly sophisticated math development. So it's a, it's a great idea. It's hard to pull off. Um, but it's very widespread. Uh, Head Start uh, essentially mandates that a whole child curriculum uh, is used uh, in Head Start centers. Um, so you find that 75% of Head Start centers report using uh, whole child curriculum. The curriculum creative curriculum is one of the most popular uh, ones. It's $2,000 per classroom to put uh, in place. Uh, whole child curricula show up in 40% of pre-K classrooms. Um, so they're very, uh, it's a very widespread um, modal kind of uh, approach to what the curriculum in early childhood education should look like. Um, in contrast, there are content-specific that use our curricula that focus on developing math skills, focus on developing literacy skills, focus on developing executive function. Uh, sometimes these are on top of uh, a whole child curricula. So if you come in with this kind of organized pattern um, of, uh, of, it's not direct instruction, it's often a play-based kind of uh, uh, academic, academically oriented curriculum. The question is, can you do better right, than, um, than just a child approach? And then finally, there's this kind of catch-all category. If you don't mandate a curriculum, local centers, teachers are able to come up with it on their own. So we really want to know, relative to uh, what can be developed uh, by centers on their own, you do better with a whole child curriculum, you do better with a content specific curriculum. So um, this is, um, these are results of a meta-analysis that uh, was recently conducted. Um, this uh, is a student of mine actually, um, who looked up uh, and discovered all the evaluation studies on curricula that were published between 1990 and 2016. Right? There were dozens and dozens of these. Um, and then there's a systematic way of, uh, of determining what uh, the impacts are, your average impacts across all the relevant studies. And you end up with an average difference, in this case, between kids uh, who've been exposed to a whole child curricula versus kids who are in um, uh, a center that just has a curriculum that teachers are coming up with on their own. Right? So this is the can you do better with a creative curriculum uh, or uh, the Perry Preschool uh, High School. That's another example of a, of a whole child curricula. Can you do better? So these, uh, the scale here is standard deviation units. Right? If the bar was up to 0.25, that would say um, that whole child curricula kids scored a quarter of a standard deviation. That's about the gap uh, in terms of um, School readiness for low-income kids versus middle-income kids. Right? It's about a uh, quarter of a standard deviation is about um, uh, a quarter of what kids learn over the course of a, a year. So it's a couple of months of learning. Uh, when you do these comparisons and average over all the relevant studies, you actually get a slight negative estimate that kids are worse off after a year. It's not a significant difference, but it's essentially saying that kids are no better off in terms of their school readiness. Um, and here it's academic outcomes. Uh, having gone through a year with a whole child curricula versus something that uh, the centers can come up with on their own. Right? This, is, this is what's in most early child education classrooms. It's a very uh, discouraging result. The curricula doesn't seem to work. It's not saying that this uh, kind of whole child approach will never work, but it's saying that the, our attempts to actually incorporate a whole child approach into existing curricula uh, don't seem to be 
service is any better than what um, they would get if they were in a classroom where the teachers were just developing something on their own. All right, so what happens if you add uh, a, a, an achievement-oriented curriculum on top of a whole child curriculum or on top of what um, a classroom is developing on its own? So in the first bar here, right, it's a, uh, a math versus whole child. So if you add to what's there, um, one of the most popular math curricula adds about 15 minutes of uh, math activities in a play-based kind of way. Uh, every day to the classroom, run it for a year, how much better in these academic outcomes are kids. Uh, and you see that they're quite a bit better, they're about a third of the standard deviation or so. It's, uh, that's three months of learning uh, of an advantage for the kids who've been uh, in this uh, set of classrooms that has the math curriculum versus not. Uh, in the case of literacy, there are also significant gains, but it's not as much. Uh, there tend to be uh, more natural literacy activities and literacy learning in whole child uh, kind of curricula classrooms. Uh, so literacy, focused literacy doesn't add that much, uh, but it still adds a significant amount. So if you're interested in, again, promoting school readiness, find in terms of literacy and math uh, school readiness. The gaps between low and high income kids in terms of uh, literacy and math entering school are enormous. They're, they're a standard deviation, right? So you can make progress in reducing those gaps uh, with these curricula uh, that focus on academic uh, topics, but not with existing whole child curricula. All right, so bottom lines, uh, these mandated, largely mandated whole child curricula do not appear to work, uh, and there's stronger evidence that academically focused curricula do promote school readiness. All right, so my uh, best bets for policies to promote school readiness, uh, worry about the curriculum and less about classroom structure, uh, and go for a play-based academically oriented curriculum uh, that also develops socio-emotional skills. Uh, I've studied the, uh, the Boston pre-K uh, system, which um, incorporates a, uh, a curriculum that combines a proven math curriculum, a proven literacy curriculum, uh, and a proven socio-emotional development curriculum. Uh, and it's strongly coached, costs a lot of money. Uh, school teachers uh, in Boston pre-K are um, public school teachers with public school salaries. Uh, but the combination of all those things produces very big gains in what kids are learning in Boston pre-K, not only in terms of academic skills, but also in terms of uh, socio-emotional skills. So it is possible to put together at scale, this is across all of Boston, uh, a successful um, kind of uh, pre-K setting that uh, incorporates the best practices from what we've learned. All right, so far we've only talked about uh, the end of pre-K, right? Uh, boosting school readiness. Um, I think uh, a lot of people have been led to believe um, that investing money in early education necessarily pays off very handsomely. We've got uh, evidence from these old um, model projects, Perry Preschool, Abbasidarian, many of you have probably heard about this. Um, they were um, developed by researchers, they were run by researchers, um, they were evaluated with a very strong random assignment design, kids were followed for 40 years, 50 years afterwards, and they're spectacularly successful, right? The kids who came out of Perry or came out of Abbasidarian uh, end up earning more, committing less crime, you know, you name it, and they're coming out with, uh, with better, um, better performance. And if you add up the, the benefits, monetize the benefits, you know, for Perry Preschool, it's a $15,000 uh, annual expenditure, and you get $200,000 of, of benefit, right? That's something run by researchers, not at scale, in the 1960s, right? Now, uh, policy has a much higher bar to meet, and it provides uh, early education. Um, Kids today uh, are in coming out of families where parent education levels are much higher, 
Um, the number of siblings they have is much smaller. The amount of uh, center-based alternatives that are available now uh, is much greater than it was back in the 60s and 70s. So if you're offering some early childhood education program, the kids who don't get in there uh, are often in some other centers, right? So the bar today for policy is to be able to uh, do better than what's out there uh, now. And even though there wasn't a fade out for Perry Preschool and Abbasidarian, uh, if you look across uh, programs today, you get much more discouraging evidence that you promote gains at the end of the preschool year, but they quickly fade afterwards. So let me provide uh, one uh, illustration here. Um, this is a, uh, a mathematics curriculum. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's a nice play base. This is the 15 to 20 minutes of supplemental activities. Uh, kids learn a lot of math over the course of the year uh, with this curriculum. Building blocks is what it's called. Um, and indeed, if you look at the, the kids who have building blocks versus those that don't, uh, in terms of how much math they learn at the end of the year, it's two-thirds of a standard deviation. Right? So it's, it's, uh, it more than makes up the gap uh, in terms of math scoreiness between uh, low-income kids and middle-income kids. Right? It's a very effective uh, curriculum. But the question is, uh, that's the gain at the end of the pre-K year. Can, does that gain persist? You really, uh, you really want it to persist as long as possible. Uh, with this particular study, they tracked the kids um, and found that the gains rapidly disappeared. Right? By third grade, there were no differences between the kids who had had the building blocks math and the kids who didn't have the building blocks math. It's very, uh, it's very discouraging that you had these strong gains for kids coming into kindergarten, but the other kids rapidly caught up to them in terms of their math. Um, I did a, um, a group that did a, a meta-analysis um, of uh, all early childhood education programs published between 1960 and 2007. Uh, and this is a subset that actually tracked uh, their kids beyond the end of the program. Right? If you want to have a successful program, don't follow kids beyond the end of the program because uh, it'll be very discouraging. Uh, when you do, um, the average impact, uh, these again um, are cognitive achievement type in impacts. Uh, the average uh, difference between the kids who are in the program versus those who weren't is about a quarter of a standard deviation. But look how quickly that fades out. You lose half of that effect after a year. Uh, and then half of that half um, by uh, a few a few years later, right? Um, to, for insignificant differences. So fade out is a very pervasive kind of feature of our early childhood education programs now. Um, so we can't just be content in thinking we've done our job with early education if kids are going into kindergarten ahead of where they would be if they hadn't uh, been in the early education classroom. Um, so that brings me to the last um, part of the talk where I want to get to a linkage between what's going on in early education and what's going on in K-12. So um, why, why do things fade out? It's not that kids are forgetting what they learned. Um, it's that kids who weren't in the early education uh, program rapidly catch up, right? And it's really hard to think of academic skills that you can promote in a pre-K year that aren't taught in kindergarten to everybody, right? So you've got these kids who come into kindergarten ahead, and unless the teacher is uh, able to devote as much attention to keeping the kids who are already ahead advancing, um, the kindergarten teacher certainly has to make sure that all kids who don't have basic skills get them. But what about the skills who have the basic skills? To what extent are they uh, move forward? And you really want uh, both. So we need, um, we need to teach the basic skills in uh, early education settings uh, and provide, uh, I think the metaphor here is nice, a charging station right, in kindergarten and first grade and second grade to take this gain from the early, ed early childhood education year uh, and keep it charged, keep that advantage going uh, into the early elementary grades. 
Uh, and for that, you can't just be talking with the early childhood world. Right? It's got to be crosstalk between what goes on in the early childhood education world and what goes on in the K-12 world. And a lot of those conversations aren't, uh, aren't taking place these days. Uh, so we really need curriculum alignment, uh, coaching. Um, it's hard if you're a kindergarten teacher to simultaneously make sure the kids who don't have the basic skills get the basic skills, uh, but also to be able to attend to the kids who have the basic skills and keep them ahead. Right? Um, we typically don't have that as part of how we teach kindergarten teachers how to uh, run their kindergarten classrooms. Um, and we need to think carefully about um, how to do that, uh, think about kind of coaching that kindergarten teachers might need in order to pull that off. So this alignment issue, I think, looms very large uh, in the early childhood education landscape, even though it's not just early education, it's early education uh, linked up with K-12 uh, schooling. So uh, I want to emphasize I'm not uh, advocating for drill and kill in the uh, early childhood year. Um, you know, you can drill and kill in elementary school, but don't do it in, uh, at age four because uh, four-year-olds learn through play, right? And uh, what these effective curricula do uh, is really teach the skills in the context of play. If you go into a uh, classroom where building blocks uh, is taking place, kids are having a lot of fun. It's very, uh, very play-based. So whatever's going on in the early childhood education classroom, um, even if it's promoting academic skills, needs to be done in the context of play. It needs to be tailored to the kind of ways that uh, four-year-olds learn best. All right, so uh, my list of uh, possible ways of sustaining uh, early childhood education contacts. Oops. Okay. Um, First of all, make sure that uh, preschool and early grade teachers uh, are able to teach numeracy and literacy by knowing uh, what they're teaching. It tends not to be the case now, but ought to be the case more. Um, as I've said, I would advocate using uh, proven. Uh, we've got a lot of evaluations out there. Uh, we want to use a proven uh, pre-K uh, curriculum. Um, to the extent possible, we want to integrate what goes on in pre-K with what goes on in the early grades. Uh, I think co-location is something to, you know, the transitional kindergarten uh, program is co-located in the school. A lot of uh, Head Start centers aren't, a lot of uh, pre-K uh, classrooms are not. But the more integrated things are physically, uh, the more the pre-kindergarten teachers are going to be talking to the early grade teachers. Um, you know, ideally, if you can think about a, a, a kind of an integration of teaching skills so that a second grade teacher can take a turn teaching in the pre-K year and vice versa, um, you start then to get a good idea of what the continuity of learning goals are, right, between learning goals for uh, the pre-K year and learning goals in the kindergarten and so forth. You know, we've got Common Core. Uh, learning goals that are uh, being implemented uh, and to uh, think about the extension of those common core learning goals back into the pre-K year so that we get as much coordination as possible I think is a very uh, productive way of thinking about this. Um, my colleague minute, I think I can handle it. Wait a minute, I can't handle it. <laughs> so I propped up this thing. Now I'm going to do that. All right. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so uh, Deborah Stipek is a uh, researcher at uh, Stanford. Uh, she's dean of the education school at Stanford. Um, she's a terrific uh, developmental psychologist who has thought very seriously about this alignment issue. Um, some of what she's thinking about are summarized in this uh, social policy report, Brief, from the Society for Research on Child Development. Uh, I would recommend people interested uh, just 
uh, Google, uh, SRCD, Social Policy, uh, SkyTech. And you'll, this will pop right up. It's a very thoughtful kind of discussion of what we need to do. And that is it. Thank you very much.